Alrighty, hello. I hope everyone had um, a fantastic weekend. It was St. Patrick's Day yesterday, so I'm wearing, um, you know, a very, a very uh, true t-shirt, world's tallest leprechaun. Uh, why not, right? YOLO, right? Um, so we only have three weeks of class left, if you can believe it. Um, so, you know, kind of like our week on health and disabilities and aging, um, I'm trying to cram in as much sociology as I can uh, into this course. So we kind of have a triple week. Again, it's the publisher that did that as well, not just me. So clearly other people think there are more than 20 topics uh, an intro class can, uh, can teach. Um, so this week we discuss, we discuss the broad, uh, the, you know, it's kind of, it kind of goes in order. Um, this week we discuss the broad process of social change, and then we see how social change can be composed of what are called social movements and collective behavior. Um, so I tried to reduce the information as much as I can, uh, as much as I could, because I know the last few weeks have been um, a little bit rushed. Um, so this week, again, we're, we're going to cover this material. Um, the, in terms of midterm grades, they're just being finalized right now, uh, so I hope to release them tomorrow night. Um, so I think right now, the average as it stands is a couple percent higher than test one, um, so it's high 60s, so you're, you're doing great. Um, again, for, you know, remember you have your tutorials and Revel and uh, to, to bring your grades up, plus the final, um, which is worth 25% uh, and your assignment three. So still lots of room to improve if you're not sitting exactly where you'd like to be sitting, uh, but the class is doing well for a first year class. Um, again, university's kind of uh, backwards in the way that it starts out harder in terms of class averages and then gets easier. Um, the more you specialize in a topic, you know, once you know all this foundational knowledge, subsequent courses, even though the content will be objectively harder, um, they'll be subjectively easier because you'll, you'll know more. Um, you'll have been socialized into university life and the discipline, and you'll develop your little vernaculars and ways of understanding all your disciplines. Um, so this week, again, uh, our tutorials, starting on Wednesday, we'll be reviewing it's test two, much like uh, I think it was tutorial five that reviewed test number one. So I selected um, some of the, the toughest multiple choice questions that, that people struggled with. Um, and uh, the short answer questions, I kind of went through the TA's broad feedback. Um, so like last time, Jason will post a global feedback announcement and document, um, and then the grades will be released again, hopefully tomorrow night. Um, and yeah, and, and we really are nearing the end. We only have uh, the tutorials this week, and then the assignment next week, and then the final tutorials and final lecture um, in two weeks. So we, uh, we're sad, sad time talking about an unwanted social change, right, of the, of the termination of Soch AO3. Um, although, you know, the benefit of having YouTube videos is that the memory of the class will live on in, in a form of tangible material culture online forever. Um, so, what is social change? Um, well, social change is, is a pretty simple concept when you're just coming at it from the outside. It is the change in something that you consider to be a social fact or an aspect of society that changes. Um, so it could be the definition or defining of a certain form of behavior, um, something that once, once was deviant, for example, uh, could now seem mainstream. Um, so for example, um, being a member of the LGBTQ community, that would be deviant um, decades ago, but now it is seen, um, you know, it's not quite quote unquote normal in everyone's eyes. That's what we discussed in our gender and sexuality weeks, um, the concept of heterosexism, um, but it has been tending towards uh, the process of normalization. Um, so that's one example of social change. Another one in terms of our religious week would be the influence of religion on, every, on, on just everybody's everyday lives. Um, so the process of secularization, again, linked to Weber's idea of rationalization, that as societies become more complex, the state and the church will separate, um, and over time, religion's influence will go down. 
Um, so sexuality, religion, gender norms, you can think about any kind of substantive topic we've discussed so far in this class um, and see it through the lens of social change. Um, so ultimately, that's the big take home that we'll be addressing this week of, you know, to what extent do things change in society and do they change through collective behavior, through social movements, through slow processes, through very quick, sudden movements. Um, these are the sorts of things that scholars of social movements and social change and collective behavior, um, th these are the questions they ask. Um, so social change is usually framed as an ongoing and inevitable process. So functionalists, as we know, were sometimes criticized by uh, more contemporary sociologists and even like Karl Marx himself, uh, you know, about almost 200 years ago, um, for assuming that society, that yes, it does change, but that change is very slow um, and that change may not be a good thing. Um, so here, this, we see that changes are around us all the time and continuing to grow. Uh, cultures change, legal policies change, norms change around the world. Um, so when we get to kind of functionalism versus conflict theory and some of the more substantive sociological theories that cover social change, um, we'll again see how uh, critics often see What's, what's seen as classical sociology as assuming that this process um, is maybe much less alterable um, and less permanent and a mainstay um, than it is in contemporary society. Um, so ultimately, again, this, we're, we're going, this is a highly theoretical week, um, but the core definition of the central concepts we're discussing of social change, collective behavior, and social movements, as we'll see, um, are, are pretty simple. So again, social change is just we're looking at any of the topics we've covered so far and we're putting on our little different theorist hat and we're asking, you know, to what extent is this process going to change over time? To what extent has it changed? How has it changed? Why hasn't it changed? All, the, all those sorts of things. Change is the, is the motor of action. Um, so change often occurs through one of two processes. Um, so just as a, a roadmap for today, if you haven't looked at the slides already, again, we have the three central concepts, social change, collective behavior, and social movements, um, and then we'll look at theories of each of them. Uh, again, they're all interrelated. You can't really have, um, you, you can't really study social change without studying any of these elements, but they are analytically distinct. Um, so that'll, that'll be the arc of today's lesson, uh, getting, getting across what the three are, how we see them theoretically, and then applying them to um, concrete behavior. Yep. Can activities both be the collective behavior and the social movement? Sorry? Uh, can what events uh, both have identity with the collective behavior and the social movement? Yes, definitely. They can, they can both be together. So we'll get to examples of that. Um, but again, as we see, collective behavior is typically when you think of a crowd, people uh, rallying together, and a social movement um, is a more long-term uh, crowding effect. Um, so something like feminism and the civil rights movement, those involve both collective behaviors, so people getting together and protesting and rallying, um, and then many doing that at many central in many central places. So let's say there was, um, let's focusing on the feminist movement, um, you could see women all across North America gathering in different major cities and kind of pressing parliament. Um, so that's how they work together. So yeah, that, that's a great question. So we'll be, we'll be getting to that. Um, again, collective beho behavior and social movements are two ways in which social change happens. So again, social change is the broader one. Um, that's like the outcome you're looking at. And the empirical question is, you know, given X social change, so let's say there's a change in gender norms, a change in, ra a change in race norms, um, to what extent was that change the product of collective behavior or of social movements um, or of, you know, naturally changing laws if you're taking like an evolutionary perspective? Um, so, so again, great question. They're, they're very interrelated, but they don't always have to be. Uh, and I'll give some funny examples uh, of, of those as well, related to this course. Um, so again, these, the, the core definitions are pretty simple. Collective behavior is when a group of people get together um, and they have a meaningful short-term goal. So collective behavior, um, I was, me and, me and Jason and the TAs were really worried 
on the day of the midterm um, that uh, uh, the, or the test two because of the snowstorm um, that students would just say okay we're not going to show up um, and then you know I, I was emailing back students and saying uh, well the, the registrar's office is the one who decides this please come to the test if you don't have you know accommodations or whatever um, because unfortunately I just would have to give you zero because it's not I don't have I don't have uh, any leeway here um, and so some students did say they were going to write to the registrar's office and some students parents emailed me and things and and so I was just hoping I'm like okay well if this becomes a big enough moment of collective behavior then you know U of T will be in trouble um, but I don't want people to think that I'm preventing uh, them from from changing the test date uh, it's just out of my control um, so collective behavior, think of any time a group of people get together and they want to change something now. Um, so even like the raising of minimum wage, people might rally for that. Um, as a graduate student, uh, there was the teaching assistant strike you may have heard of. York had one recently. Um, so those are, those are people getting together uh, to have a relatively tangible outcome. Um, and we'll see that it's very important in collective behavior and social movements alike that your outcomes should be discernible, um, so they should be material and clear, that way people can rally behind them. Um, so social movements, by contrast, um, they are more general, um, so typically social movements will emerge out of collective behavior, so people getting together and protesting uh, for something tangible, for something clear and specific, such as, for example, um, you know, allowing black individuals on in, into quote-unquote um, non-white people washrooms or something in the, in the mid-20th century in America, um, or allowing uh, transgender individuals to use whichever washroom uh, they, they'd like. Um, so, uh, so those can be um, those could be simple, relatively simple events. Um, that then lead to broader social movements. Um, so looking at washroom accessibility and looking at legislation of transgender issues, for example, could then lead to a broader social movement of, of more inclusive rights for transgender individuals. Um, so again, so here, collective behavior are usually tangible. Again, all of you resisting going to the midterm and then being part of a broader social movement of saying, you know, students should have more power when it comes to um, their testing and, and their um, evaluations and things like that. It's kind of scaling up. Yep. And I ask that, uh, if the outcome has to be tangible, because so many uh, feminist, uh, feminist uh, activism, they just want to the, the social the values that the changes, that the society is not man. Actually, it is not tangible, but actually it's, it still belongs to the outcome of the, the feminist activism events. Yeah, so, uh, so they often do blur in practice. In any specific rally, when you look at them, the, so the, the specific protesting events, they usually um, do anchor around one central thing. So it could be the termination or, or a woman getting fired from a position, someone not getting promoted, um, uh, gender rights in another country. Usually there's one sort of outcome you can kind of grapple with, um, but you're right. Most collective behaviors are inspired by a broader, more intangible issue of equality or rights. Um, so even if students, again, and I'm just, I'm talking about this because it's an example, let's say everyone had already been mobilizing against me in this class. So let's say there was already a latent social movement. Then you may have used the storm as like your one example and being like, okay, here we can get him and we can turn on social AO3 and then we can say all these things. We can say, yeah, he made us do these study buddy activities. He's like forcing us to subscribe to him, da da da. So you can, you know, well, no, but I, see, you haven't because only like a fifth of you have. So, so then that wouldn't work, but hint, hint. Um, but, um, but these two things work in common, right? So, so collective behaviors often die, like they don't become uh, part of a big movement because they don't become linked to, some, to a big intangible. Um, so, so it's great, great questions uh, from the front. Again, um, most collective behaviors are marked by a clear outcome, but they're inspired by something bigger. Um, and if the two, if, if you're emphasizing too much of the intangible or too much of the tangible, neither will work. You, a, a good balance for effecting social change is having clear outcomes that resonate with your audience um, 
and uh, a broader kind of argument behind it. Um, so we'll see that with the examples of, of successful social movements, um, again, such as those around race, gender, and sexuality, um, where people could point to human rights violations, um, job terminations, abuses, uh, and then nest that within a broader uh, theoretical understanding of, of citizen rights. Um, so again, it, it's harder to form uh, a successful social movement if you can't justify the broader argument, but you also need to say, okay, um, changing this will have X, Y, Z results. It's kind of like writing an essay, right? You need the big, larger argument and the justification for why you're doing what you're doing, um, but then you also have to spell it out in clear steps. So um, again, the logic is quite similar. Um, so following that social change, so, so I kind of just have that um, outlined here uh, in terms of what would make it uh, the most, again, if you're thinking of, 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 of doing some sort of social change, um, you'd want to meet these four criteria. Um, again, you don't have to. It's not a rigid list, but, but, but meeting these four criteria increases the odds of the social change um, resonating with people, being meaningful, and actually sticking. Um, so when the, so it's, more, it's most likely to occur when um, the change occurs in something or in a medium um, that's seen as cutting edge or scientific. Um, so for example, if you're looking at clothing and fashion, um, fashion tends to change based on what goes on in Paris and Milan and New York runways. Um, so big runways that draw major media attention um, and are seen as trend setting. Um, fashion, fashion will stick from those events versus things that get very little attention or do not have very many accolades. Um, so, you know, again, using, using this as an example, um, I highly doubt that there's going to be a whole bunch of people buying world's tallest leprechaun leprechaun t-shirts um, from Dollarama, which is actually where I got it. Um, so, yeah, so that's how, that's how much I'm invested um, in, my, in my clothing. Um, I don't actually buy my clothes at Dollarama. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but I was, I was buying candy and stuff, and then I was like, world's tallest stuff, but that's kind of funny for me, because I'm tall, sort of. So anyway, so um, anyway, so I'm not a model, and this is not a fashion runway, um, so it's very unlikely that this will result in fashion change. I'm not in the fashion field, I'm not seen as that, um, and the audience is relatively small. Um, um, so the change addresses, addresses a strongly felt need among the public. Um, so again, uh, if I'm trying to get people to wear this t-shirt or buy their clothes at Dollarama, that may not be a very strong need if I'm just if I have very little justifications, um, whereas if I got up here and I was trying to change something more relevant to the course, um, so let's say you know this week is about social change, and I focused on an example, um, let's say of child poverty um, in, in a certain city or certain country, and I gave you evidence, uh, that would resonate much more with you uh, and kind of bring you on my side if it's something you already think is important rather than just something I, I potentially made up because it's St. Patrick's Day. Um, linked to what I was saying earlier, um, the change is most likely to occur when the, when the desired change is material rather than, um, than non-material. Um, so for example, let's say you, there's this, this is in the news a lot, issues of public transit. Um, so very often, you know, many people, many Torontonians at least, they want more funding uh, for the TTC. They either want less, you know, they, they want uh, ticket costs to go down um, or expansion of the subway, quicker bus routes. You know, we all have our, our complaints about the TTC. Um, so to be effective um, in terms of making this uh, in, in terms, uh, in, so to try to make an, uh, a productive case for boosting the TTC, um, you may want to make your argument more about, okay, what, what can we do to increase this? Um, so if you send out brochures, so let's say, in, let's do the vague first, um, you could send people a bunch of brochures saying the benefits of mass transit, um, but those are all kind of abstract for people. Um, what you could do if you wanted to increase funding for the TTC is you could actually focus on something somewhat indirect. 
So you could focus on the kind of fuel they're using. And you could say, you know what? Actually, the TTC is using, using f uh, fuel that's very bad for the environment. Um, or it's using fuel that's actually expensive. Um, so if we switch the way buses and trains are made, maybe we could use different, um, we could have different accesses to use different kinds of electricity, use different kinds of fossil fuels that would both be better for the environment and cost less money. Um, so rather than having some broad, uh, relatively abstract claim of, you know, mass transit is better for society um, for a whole bunch of theoretical reasons, you could shift the argument and say, actually, um, we could make the TTC run much more efficiently and we could expand our routes if we did this tangible thing, switching the kind of fuel it uses or even, you know, um, opening up one specific route or adding in uh, extra trains between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., like not having the 24-hour period or something. Um, so again, peop it's not that people are resistant to social change, but very often social change doesn't happen because people don't know exactly what you want them to do. So that's kind of the point of the material versus non-material. Um, if people argue for world peace, for example, that's something that doesn't go away, um, many people may support that in the abstract, but they don't know what exactly that causes them to do. What do I have to do to support that? Um, do I donate to a charity? Do I be a better person in my private life? Do I like travel the world as a nice um, visitor? Um, all of these things are kind of vague, whereas if you're telling me, okay, donate X to this cause for this reason, um, that's generally more compelling uh, for people. Um, and then very importantly too, and we'll see this as a kind of central debate point between functionalists and other thinkers, um, in order for the change to actually manifest or come about, um, it's, it's, or it's much more likely for the change to come about if it makes sense and this is where the sociological imagination comes in, um, and the benefit of always you know, seeing things through multiple theories, um, it's much more likely to come about if the change is compatible with people's existing values. Um, so the example here is that recy recycling programs are more likely to succeed um, among populations or groups of individuals that are sensitive to environmental catastrophe um, and, and pollution and litter. Um, so if people have already been exposed through school courses or family members to the idea that the environment is in danger, um, so even if, you know, even, if you, if, even if it's on their radar that um, global warming is a thing and climate change is a thing, um, having that information will make a person more receptive to the idea that, hey, maybe I should recycle. Um, if you just tell someone, you know, recycling is good and, and it, 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 it emits less uh, carbon, carbon fumes and gases, um, they may think, okay, that's good, but there's a lot of things I could be doing differently. Um, whereas if they're already uh, knowledgeable of the fact that that's part of a broader process of environmental degradation, um, then it could be much more important for them. like the boss of the factory, maybe they, they know that uh, their behavior is not good for the environment. And they have awareness, but actually, they, for the profits and benefits, they still do that, to, just to, to destroy the environment. Though they have awareness that the environment is very important. Oh, definitely, yeah. And that's why this is just, so the student's point is um, many people know that something that they're doing may not be good um, for a certain outcome, but they continue to do it anyway. Um, this, you know, you, you can't get someone to change if they're benefiting. That's where what conflict theorists will come in and say, you know, this is all well and good to think that, but if someone's benefiting from a process that they know has negative outcomes for other people, um, making them aware of something they already know won't cause them to change. Um, so this is more just talking about statistically on average things you can, go, things you can do to get people to change. Um, but in those cases, you know, uh, I think th those are perennial debates that people have. Um, if someone really is resistant to change, uh, you can't just lay out, um, you know, for just, just again, for example, um, my work before on video game addiction and based on my own experiences too, I, would, I could write out lists myself and I could, you know, I would purposely read studies that showed negative effects of video games, um, but I still kept playing because I felt, you know, well, there's also positive aspects um, and I enjoy this. Um, so even in terms of, of recycling and pollution, someone might know, okay, maybe I should recycle, 
but then you know they're tired or they feel lazy um, or they or they start to justify it through some other means. Um, so again, these are just factors that increase the chances, but ultimately, again, our our binaries, uh, people have agency. So social change does not always simply happen. Um, okay, so one example that I thought would be fun that the textbook, I'm glad the textbook talks about this, because um, it'll be nice to get your uh, different generational insight on these things. Um, so the next few slides in the discussion question will be talking about, as one instance of social change, um, you know, related to the pedagogical changes I've made in this course over the year of, of you know, doing YouTube videos and using Mentimeter and stuff, um, I'm trying to tap into the concept that Prensky uh, discussed in you know, 2001, so a while ago, um, but this idea of digital natives versus digital immigrants. Um, and so this has nothing to do with ethnicity or race or immigration or anything, um, but what, what the concepts of digital native and digital immigrant, um, what they're trying to, to get forward is the notion that um, for many people, uh, working online, working with music in the background, being very socially connected in social media, um, just being digital, quote unquote, um, is something much more natural and automatic for some people than for others. Um, so for digital natives, expecting to do things online, reading things on their phone, um, answering questions uh, such as multiple such as course evaluations, um, doing those online versus doing them on paper, um, that for some individuals that might be much more natural than for others. Um, so the simple definition, again, is a digital native. Uh, which they say is a digital speaker. So again, kind of like, like language. Um, there's someone who spent their entire lives using computers, the internet, cell phones, and video games. Whereas a digital immigrant is more, they have like a digital accent. So they're not quite enmeshed in this. Um, you know, again, it's, it's different. I, I don't remember, I don't know for sure what the current research says about accents, but um, what it's drawing on here is that if you don't, there's a certain age um, at which if you don't learn a language before that age, you, you probably will always have an accent in that language. Um, I think it's age 14 or 13, something like that. Um, so here, that's what they mean. So if you start using digital technology in your teens, you may always feel it's a little bit awkward. Um, it may not be your go-to thing. Um, whereas if you start as a young child, you may then feel that many um, physical, interpersonal things are not your thing, and you may opt for digital versions of that. Um, so here, here's a list of examples. Um, so just comparing native to immigrant. Um, so, so again, the, so this, this builds very much on our socialization week, right? So um, a digital native, for example, studies or reads with music and or television on, um, whereas a digital immigrant studies or reads in silence. Um, now this is something, see, and it's funny, because I try, I try to uh, digitize myself, so I listen to, uh, I, I, I do try to listen to music while I'm reading, um, but I, I do have to say, if people are talking around me when I'm reading, I can't, I can't read it all, it competes. And then I just start eavesdropping and like trolling their conversations. I just can't focus. Uh, even if they're talking about something boring, I just, my mind goes there. Um, so I don't know, I'm interested to see what people think about that when we get to the study buddy question. But for me, I don't know, I'm some hybrid of that. Um, frustrated when email is not replied to immediately, the digital native. Um, the digital immigrant calls to see if you've received email. Um, ignores email forwards versus replies to and sends email forwards. Um, uses text messaging versus does not see the point of text messaging. Reads text and emails from computer screen versus prints out texts and emails to read it from paper. That might be a bit extra. I don't really know who would do that, but maybe someone. Um, uh, embraces new technology, is nervous about new technology, buys music online, buys it from a store. That's getting more difficult to do. Reads online newspapers, reads paper ones. Again, we might do both. Engages in instant chats, Facebook Messenger, communicates through phone calls. So that's a big difference, I think. Um, keeps cell phone on at all times versus turns it off. Has latest video games versus plays older ones. Um, program, uh, programs television so as to not miss an episode. That's a bit dated. Obviously, now there's Netflix and stuff. Um, alters schedule around television show, but the idea is still the same. Um, and then uses Google Maps versus paper maps, maps and multitask versus does one thing at a time. 
Um, so most of you should have that list. I, I know, again, digital natives, most of you have laptops or, or phones with you. Um, so what I'd like you to do, I thought this would be fun, and then we can, to, to digitize this again, I'll have, you can put your responses in Mentimeter afterwards. Um, so what I'd like you to do is use, using those categories, give yourself a quote unquote digital native score. Um, so give yourself one point, and I, and I can keep, I'll keep this side up uh, and switch afterwards for those that don't have anything, um, that don't have it available. Um, but give yourself a digital native score by giving yourself one point uh, for everything that you score as a digital native on on the list. So for example, if you study or read with music and, te and or television on, give yourself a point of one. Um, if you study anything in the immigrant one, give yourself a zero, because uh, we're just trying to focus on how much of a digital native are you. Um, so you could have a score as high as 14. Um, so, and, and I just want to see where people vary, um, so we can talk about that. Um, OK, so for now, again, just go through the lists and give yourself a score. So you can do this individually at first. It's OK. And then we, then you, we can discuss. Uh, we'll discuss after. So again, you can just go through the list for everything that you score digital native. Give one point. Um, you can keep note of the ones that you get zeros on. Um, but again, the point is I just want to see out of 1 to 14, where do social AO3 students lie? Yep. Can we get 0 0.5? <laughs> you can give yourself a half mark if you're in the middle, you think. Yeah. I would be in the middle on some. If you really can't decide, then give your, yeah, if you really can't decide on one, give a 0.5. That's a good idea. I think it's interesting to think through this stuff, just to see, you know, how do you spend your time? What do you prefer? So remember, there's eight options on this one and six on the other. So there's 14. So out of 14, what's your score? I'll do mine too. Okay, so once you have your score, I'll still leave that up, but once you have your score, then you can use code 821033, and it should come up as little as, as those big images. Um, so we'll see what number wins. Fourteen in the house. Okay, yeah, that's pretty much what I would have thought. I think I'm about a 10. I'm a 9 or 10. So that's when I did it myself. I'm a little bit more than most people my generation just because of my, my elite video gaming. But um, yeah, so. Okay. All right. Good. So that's good to know. See, we know our peers. So we are, so, you know, the way I would, we're, we're like two thirds towards total digitization on average. I would say the average there just by that. Um, I mean, it's too small, but it looks like 11. Um, because, the, because that means there's a few 12s, few 10s, few 11s. Um, 16 extra. Okay. All right. 
Um, all right. Um, so now compare with your buddies. Um, so what you can do is, um, you know, I'd like to see which issues you differ on. Um, so for example, you know, um, did one of you score higher because of using text messaging or another one, you know, multitasking? Um, just talk for a couple minutes with, you, with your buddies um, and see what you scored differently on. So if you think there's something that you, it might be the easiest, if you think there's something um, that you put a digital immigrant on, you can say that to your group. Like, I put digital immigrant on these four things, what did you? Because uh, you more, since the average is high, you mostly put native for most things. You know, it's good, see? It's like not going to have a social change in terms of having people use this scale and think differently. That's, that's good, it's fast. Nope, I already knew myself, nope. Um, uh, my PewDiePie troll is here. Um, that's funny. Nothing I already didn't know. Nope. Okay, well that's good. I guess you already knew your, and so I guess you expected what other people, um, I guess you are, yeah. <laughs> I get yes. Oh, so you're saying yes just because I'm looking for yeses now. But that, I appreciate that. But it's, it's, all, it's all pretty obvious. No. Okay. Well, see, that's the thing. Because when I took it, I guess, you know, I was, I'm shocked that I was as high as I was. Um, yeah. Yeah, maturity. I mean, it's also, it's, it's well, it's because this is really just about exposure to technology. Um, so again, I guess I was telling Sarah in the front um, that, you know, my dad was, he was, he did like investments online for, with his parents. Um, so we, we had computers early. Um, so I had, I'm born in 87 and that's when my dad had a Mac. So like it obviously wasn't a good computer um, even at that time, but um, I played little computer games um, ever since I was a little kid. Um, so I'm, I was saying, I'm, I'm more of a digital immigrant when it comes to cell phones, uh, because I got one of those very late. Um, but I, I was always, I had computers and I'd go to the library and go on the internet um, before we had internet too in like 1994 when I was like seven. Um, so I've always been, I've always been doing that. Um, and then for you, yeah, exactly. So that's made, uh, oh, no, I'm making up answers. Um, so I thought, <laughs> I thought someone wrote how, uh, how their, their national laws contribute to it. Um, yeah, I don't know where I read that. So, but I guess that would be, um, that would be one of them. I just, I, I somehow read maturity as that. Um, okay, so since it's good to know, again, that's the, the perk of asking things anonymously because, uh, or, uh, because I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known that, that it was so uh, underwhelming um, if I didn't ask it that way, but it's good to know. Um, so I guess, okay, the, what I was looking for in terms of outcomes influencing this, um, you know, the major thing that we learned from this, since it wasn't an epochal movement, um, was that you are mostly digital natives, and that's a product of the time and place you were raised in. Um, so, you know, there was very little heterogeneity of score, um, even seeing the 10, 11, 12 there, um, by which that means you guys lot, mostly fell on the same values, um, and since no one brought up any major discrepancies, you both probably approach um, building on our media week, uh, you approach the media the same way, the news, television, um, using, using digital platforms. I mean, you expect people to respond to emails quickly. You may avoid uh, forwarded emails. I often, I don't reply to forwarded emails uh, either, usually, unless it's like someone tailors it to me. Um, I just count it as like advertising or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we'll take a 10 minute break, um, and then when we come back, we will move, uh, we will finish our discussion of social change, um, and then move on to the next two topics. That was an announcement. Um, hi, humans. I uh, just wanted to come. You're going to hear a lot of announcements coming up more frequently after this, but I thought I'd give you some back up. So this year SOS has kind of not been as active as normally is. We generally do events at work week. We're very, very interested, especially for this class. Uh, SOS is that people who have their review session. It's the Students of Sociology, it's your student association. But the elections for next year SOS uh, are coming up. And so there's positions available for president, five VP positions, associate positions, 
there's over, I think there's about 20 positions you guys are all eligible to run for. Uh, and so more information will come on the specifics, but you quite easily you just have to say, I don't want to run for it, you have to give a quick speech and it's coming up in a month. And then you have the potential of being a part of the student association, which is absolutely fantastic. You get to be very tight and close with the sociology community, as well as you really nice thing to have on your resume, cover letter, grads, well applications, and all that jazz. So keep that in mind, you'll hear more information, but do know that you have plenty of opportunities to be a part of it, you're going into the second year, so just keep that in mind, okay? life cycle or any given aspect of social change has a life cycle. Um, so you can think of it in terms of or the life cycle of social change. Um, how does social change happen? How can we analyze different aspects of it and components of it? Um, so you can see it in terms of innovation, exponential growth, and saturation. So again, think of a social change and think, okay, what is going on? Is it, has it, has it fully saturated the market? Has the change become dominant? Um, or is it new? So for example, when something is in the innovation change, maybe only 10 to 25% of people have adopted that change. Um, so can anyone think of any examples of maybe a social change that you could think roughly 10 to 25% of people have adopted? Anything. So it doesn't have to be the exact numbers at all. It just what's a what's a change that you think people are starting to do? Yep. Like on passports and like birth certificate, people can choose to have X instead of like F or M for like gender neutrality. Mm. So I think it's not like popular. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so it doesn't have to be all the way at 10 or 25%, but, but that's exactly it. So um, choosing X instead of male or female on your passport. Um, yep? Um, the clean eating and like the veganism movement is really taking off. Well, it's still like a small portion of the population, but it's growing in like awareness. Right, so clean eating, veganism, um, also uh, like low carb, keto, paleo, all these other sorts of diets, they're all like food conscious, um, usually, so, so even, even a lot of keto diets, they're uh, so ketogenic, people having low sugar, low carb, um, they're very focused on things like grass-fed meat, um, free-range eggs, so even if they're not uh, vegetarian or vegan, they're usually opting more towards um, some sort of broader food and source consciousness. Um, yeah, so, so again, so when you're thinking of social change, some are new innovations. Um, again, they, you know, I could be part of a, of a broad social change. Maybe, um, maybe all professors will start making annoying YouTube channels, right? Um, so that could be, <laughs> hopefully not annoying, hopefully fun. Um, but people could start, maybe that'll be a social change, right? If this goes viral, hint, hint. Um, okay, so exponential growth. So, so first you start out at the innovation phase. Some people use it. You really, at this point, you don't need to know this term, but it's just, uh, but, but at this point, um, only what are called cultural entrepreneurs um, are, are really part of the change. So, um, you know, the people that are behind it. So cultural in that it's a sort of idea or, or material, tangible or intangible, um, and then entrepreneur in that they're kind of creating it themselves. Um, so, um, you know, for example, the iPad, even uh, when the iPad came out, there had already been devices um, like the Newton um, that were very similar to iPads, but they never took off. Um, so the bulk of, of items that are produced, just like the bulk of social movements, as we'll see, um, they often don't result in uh, what's called exponential growth. They don't become used by the mainstream. Um, many innovations die out. Um, so for an example of this, in, in the food industry, since we mentioned that, um, I think the statistic is something like 97% of new restaurants fail. Um, so again, think of, a, think of the restaurant scene. You could say there's a bunch of new restaurants that are in some capacity innovating in the market. Most don't make it to the exponential growth stage. 
Um, and then lastly, saturation. Um, so again, you're having this, this thing, this innovation. It starts to stick. It grows very wildly. Um, and then either it disappears after growing. Um, so a fad, for example, um, FAD, a, a fad uh, like, like fad diets. So the South Beach diet um, or the high carb diet or whatever, things that, things that we've cycled through. Um, those often go away. Um, they may come back later, but they don't fully saturate. Um, many of the topics we discuss in this class, uh, we are, you know, optimistic that things, that social change will saturate um, the environment. Um, so what's an example of maybe one of the topics we've discussed in this class where you could imagine um, we would be optimistic that social change will saturate um, Canada or the world? What's an example? Remember I said all of the weekly kind of topics we discuss, you could see through the lens of social change. Um, so what would be a kind of positive market saturation of one of the topics we've learned? Yep. Like uh, the approach to like, people with like, disabilities, like how they're you know, being accommodated in you know, this community, in society as a whole. Right, yeah. So we learned about barriers faced by uh, people experiencing disabilities. So reducing those, raising awareness. Um, that would be an example of positive social change that we hope one day will become fully saturated. Um, you know, that was in the innovation stage maybe a decade ago. It's starting to grow more quickly. I wouldn't say it's exponential yet, um, but we're hoping that tends towards saturation. Um, anything else? Yep. I don't know if it's necessarily positive, but like the secular, secularization of society is becoming pretty saturated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So again, um, yeah. So uh, it's just a more neutral example, or one you can take both sides on. Um, so secularization. So definitely, that's a trend that has taken hold, um, and you know that really um, in the last fifty years or so, uh, that's definitely saturated our kind of social landscape and our market. Um, just, just again, the, bureauc the bureaucratization of job hiring, of university courses, of training, um, of, of scientific education. Um, those are all things we we come to expect. They've pretty much saturated. Um, it's not a social movement anymore. Um, you know. Yep. Trying to eradicate um, hetero, um, hetero normalization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So so the again uh, gen in gender studies and the week on gender the weeks on gender and sexuality, um, trying to you know get people to see the the problems associated with hegemonic masculinity um, and the normalization of, of some sorts of relationships, some sorts of families, and not others. Um, again, so people that study social justice and change, they often hope that their ideas, um, that their innovations will not just stay in academia or stay in their protest circles, um, but will actually come to saturate the market. Um, so again, think, you know, when, you, when you're analyzing movements, um, and we'll see this more, more when we're looking at collective behavior and, and social movements in particular, um, but as a sociologist, we'd like to see, you know, how, how are successful social movements characterized? So what qualities do they have that enable them to first be, you know, to move from an innovation to a period of growth and then ultimately to saturation? Um, again, things can exponentially grow and then they can die. Those are fads. So obviously people don't want social ch positive social change or change that they see as positive um, to just be, you know, a trend or a fad. They kind of want it to be uh, permanent usually. Um, so an example of this, just a question to think through. You don't have to do it now. Um, think, you know, consider the life cycle of social change in relation to Google and internet, and internet networking sites such as Facebook. Um, so would these inventions count as producing social change? So if you were asked a broad question like that, using the terms you just learned, you could say, okay, well, Google and Facebook were innovations, um, you know, roughly 10 to 15 years ago, depending on which one you're talking about. Um, and these innovations grew rapidly um, over the last 10 years, and now they've fully saturated the market. Anyone with an Android phone is automatically opening Google. Um, Facebook Messenger has now taken over, like WhatsApp, and or it's or Facebook bought WhatsApp, um, and, and all these, in, and pretty much all the other instant messaging tools, like even your phone's texting. Um, those can all be put under Facebook Messenger. Um, so Facebook and 
Google, I think, are great examples of, of innovations that rapidly grew and are still growing, even though they're saturated. Um, they're getting more complex and more specific. Um, so you could think of other things, too. Um, again, the, the, the making of YouTube videos in, in classrooms. Um, that's an innovation. Will that grow? Why? What factors might prohibit that uh, or inhibit that? Um, what factors made Google and Facebook successful? Um, again, the fact that um, digital natives now uh, live, with those in, uh, live with those things in their life worlds um, from pretty much day one, um, that only feeds into the growth and saturation of these things. Um, so to close off social change before we get to collective behavior and movement, um, the two, there's a, you can look at, like any topic, you can look at them through just about any theory we've discussed in this class. Um, but the two, I think, key theories for analyzing social change center around the question of, you know, is social change natural? and desirable um, or unnaturable. So basically, is it desirable um, or is it to be seen uh, somewhat skeptically? Um, so equilibrium theory is, is the kind of functional perspective of this. Um, so it says, again, uh, sorry, uh, functionalists, as we've seen, you can imagine they would be skeptical of change as they think that every social fact, so every norm, every value, every institution in a society is like an organ in a body. Um, you know, so if you increase the size of the lung or reduce the size of the heart, um, you're going to mess with the organism. You might kill it. Um, society, you know, uh, having major protests and then changing laws around education, for example, um, may lead students to actually revolt or it may cause parents to revolt. It may cause uh, parents to take their kids out of school. Um, so think of the issues, um, you know, both, think of the debates around uh, the Ontario sex ed curriculum in the last few years. Uh, many people were resistant uh, to the opening up of sex ed in that way, and many others wanted it to be opened up. Um, so functionalists could say, you know, no, we need to maintain the way it was because if you teach kids um, these, these things about sex, they may go out and be sexual deviants or something. Um, whereas defenders of, the, of what was being taught uh, and what was proposed to be taught would say, no, if you, if you give them access to this education, then they can make more informed uh, decisions as teenagers and adults. Um, but, but this is just one example of, of a fault line where it's saying, no, we should keep things kind of the way they were because if you change it, you don't know what unintended or latent uh, consequences. Remember, latent and manifest functions. Um, changing the law could give people more awareness, but it could also do X, Y, Z. Um, so again, functionalists kind of have that, um, that, that skeptical perspective, not that they're resistant to social change, but that they think that all the things that we have in society are working in an equilibrium. So that's the idea of equilibrium theory, that you have to see, okay, the current state of affairs is balanced by other things that are going on. Um, that, that's why uh, functionalist theory is often critiqued by conflict theorists, because it assumes a kind of naturalness of the status quo. Yep. like that in World War II, the Germany, the German actually, the, when the Nazis the take powers of their government, actually they are the social change, the bad, big social change, but actually it makes the German society worse and worse, actually it's not bad. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So th that's that's their point that they think social change is not balanced. Um, so they think things the way they are are already balanced because again, society is an organism. So social change, um, again, it's like inflating the size of an organ or removing an organ. Um, so that's what they mean when they talk when they talk about say Nazi Germany. Um, oh, this change in policy, this change in outlook towards a certain demographic, then leads to this major catastrophe in World War. Um, so they they t typically use examples of social change going wrong. Um, so uh, the contrast of this, of course, is a conflict theory approach. Um, so this says that, again, so um, for, for functionalists, when change happens, so it's an important distinction, like the student mentioned, when change happens naturally in a system, for functionalism, that's usually seen as good. So for this, and, and this comes from Compt. 
So remember, Comte had the three stages, the religious stage, the metaphysical stage, and then the positivistic stage. So Comte said when social change happens in a society, it usually happens slowly and it, and it kind of unfolds. Um, change that happens suddenly, like a big change in policy, um, that could have a lot of unintended consequences because society wasn't ready for it. Um, conversely, conflict theorists say change that happens slowly does not necessarily uh, need to be a marker of improvement. Um, so think of Max Weber with rationalization um, and the process of secularization. Um, so as societies become more scientific um, and, and more bureaucratic, Max Weber said society might become more like an iron cage where people don't really feel, um, they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so think of credentialization. As, as university gets more complicated, as more programs are made, people may just need more degrees and they may not know why they need it. Um, so social change, in this perspective, um, it, you know, the conflict theory is often confused as just being pro-social change. Um, but it's also very importantly critical of social change too, saying that no, the right kinds of social change can be positive. Um, so here they say rather than just look at social change as necessarily positive and natural and slow, um, you could actually see active resistance as creating quick but very positive social change. Um, so examples of this are the ones that the students in the front gave. Um, so again, you could have legislation, uh, legislation that impacts the rights of disabled individuals. So say hiring, uh, changes in hiring and promotion policies. Um, you could have, again, changes in, in sex education. That's the, what the center of that debate is. Um, you could very quickly change uh, key curriculum um, and that could benefit people's understandings of, sex, of, of uh, sexual interactions with other people. Um, you could remove certain kind of courses that you think um, students aren't learning anything in. You could replace them with new courses. The, the list goes on, but basically for conflict theorists, um, it's saying change does not always have to be good. We have to think of what our broader values are um, and then look at any one change and see, okay, does making this change um, make sense given our values um, or may this result um, in actually negative things? Mm -hmm. um, like it's all, only going to like favor a selective amount of people according to um, conflict theorists because like for example brainwashing or like pinkwashing is kind of like promoting the market but like are they actually doing something to combat that very issue not very exactly so something like that like can, can that fall under saturation in conflict theory Definitely, yeah. So the, the changes within higher education, so that, that very kind of one of those first short answer questions I, I gave you in, in uh, test one, um, that, was, that was about, you know, does higher education have a hegemonic role uh, in, in contemporary society? Or even the question on the last test about McDonaldization. Um, a conflict theorist would say, you know, the universities came about and they were supposed to liberate people. Literally, the, the, the idea of the liberal university um, was giving uh, you know, equal access of education to everyone to give them job opportunities and critical thinking skills. But now, um, universities become the new high school um, and, and you know, actually there still is growing inequality and many people now can't afford uh, university and rising debts and all of this. So they could say that this, this university logic um, of credentialization has saturated the market that now everyone this thing that was supposed to be good and we wanted to be spread now actually has a lot of corrosive elements um, so yes so saturation um, that would be also if you know hate groups spread so let's say there were people very resistant to immigration or something um, for for you know xenophobic reasons and, and they and they grew and then uh, you know it was an innovation it stuck uh, it became exponential and then it saturated the market and you had um, you know people uh, on 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 the far side uh, politically um, really really uh, being openly bigoted or something um, so uh, negative ideas uh, in terms of social justice or in terms of state welfare can definitely saturate the market um, so that's again when you see when you see people get in big heated political debates it's usually around saturation um, so what innovations have saturated and is that saturation good or bad um, again people People make very different assumptions about uh, how people live and how people operate. Um, so one thing that's good for one person can be bad for another. 
Um, so there's no completely objectively right or wrong for most issues, um, but it's more to see why do people differ um, on, on things like welfare programs and social planning. Um, okay, so now, so that's the broad, so I spent more time on the big broad topic of social change. Again, that's the, that's the umbrella concept. And then we have two iterations or manifestations of it in the forms of collective behavior and social movements. Um, and we've already kind of implicitly been discussing them throughout. Um, so collective behavior is when people get together and they largely share some sort of cohesiveness around norms. Um, so in order for there to be collective behavior, there has to be a collectivity. Um, so again, that's a group of people who are roughly on the same page regarding a certain set of norms. So collective behavior, again, could be a feminist rally. Uh, let's say, you know, let's go back in time. Let's say it's the 70s um, or even the 60s, and you have what would now be called a second wave feminist rally. This could be people that are getting together over, um, you know, barriers to employment for women, uh, unequal representation of women in universities, some sort of tangible topic. Um, now, this uh, collectivity does not um, as, as a student in the front said, it does, I'm giving an example of a localized collectivity. So, you know, I think that's just easier to think of. So again, a collectivity, let's say feminists, they can be localized, meaning they physically get together. Um, but now that we are in the digital age and globalization is occurring and has occurred for a long time, um, collectivities don't just have to be in the form of physical crowds or mobs or protests. Um, they can often be what are called dispersed. Um, so now uh, you can and you do have feminists all around the world um, sharing things. So, so think, um, again, not necessarily lumping it in all with feminism, but, but one example of, of the kind of impact of feminism was the, the hashtag MeToo movement. Um, so when we see social movements, we'll see that's a, that's a great example of one that, you know, was an innovation that rapidly grew and that is kind of saturating the market in that now it's something people, people can say. Um, it's, a, it's a tool that, that uh, mostly women have, uh, but everyone has. Um, with the case of, of Kevin Spacey, um, it, it, you know, men were using it as well. Um, but it's now a tool that people have, an innovation that stuck um, to collect individuals experiences around the world uh, mostly in North America and involving Hollywood and politicians but um, it is growing into something bigger um, so again a collective collective behavior involves people who roughly align on some set of norms um, and then they either get together in the forms of crowds and mobs or they can meet online um, or through larger peer groups um, so again, fashion, I gave the example of, of that kind of being a trend that people just know. They see it in magazines. They see it you know, based on what celebrities are wearing. Um, similarly, rumors and gossip, those often spread in ways that aren't just like one big space, um, but they're usually aligned around norms. Um, so you'll see there's much less information uh, on, on these two topics than on the others on social change, because these are just subsets. Now, sociologically, so we get, and again, don't worry too much about all these new theories. Um, I, I said there's roughly, you know, there's three theories for this and three for social movements. Um, they're all quite intuitive, despite their kind of fancy names. Um, so when we're thinking of collective behavior, again, what am I looking for? I'm looking for moments where people are rallying together either online, so you could have people like incels, for example, the invol involuntary celibate um, uh, individuals that, that go online and talk about you know, their treatment by women or so on, um, or gamers, uh, people that uh, you know, are, are pro or con, pro or against gaming, and they do that online. Um, or you could be interested in people that actually do protests and rallies in person. Um, again, as a sociologist, we're interested in how either of those happen. How do people mobilize for change, basically, is the big question. Um, so either we can see it as irrational or rational, on the one hand, um, or as something more structural. So basically, rational or irrational or structural um, is more the way we have of seeing that. Um, so contagion theory is very simply that people become irrational about issues. 
So this is the idea you may have heard of, of the hive mind or the collective mind. It's, it's the message, it's, it's, uh, it draws on the logic of memes. Um, so memes, in case you didn't know, so M-E-M-E-S, you know, the fun things that you always wish I'd put in my lectures, but I don't, although sometimes I do. But memes, um, they are cultural messages that spread very quickly. So uh, the, the kind of the, the terminology or the defining of meme um, kind of happened in, in the reverse. Memes became called memes because they were memes. It's a very weird thing, but it, it was, this is actually theorized in the 80s, that cultural ideas that stick and spread um, are called memes, and they're seen as being self-replicating. Um, so when we think of a meme, we think of things that are funny and stick. Um, so, so that's kind of where that definition came. Um, so it's you know, some idea of, a, of an image with text, maybe a GIF, or something, um, and those are very funny and intuitive and sticky. Um, so contagion theory says most um, crowd behavior and collective behavior is the product of something tapping into your rational side. Um, either you're following the crowd, you're following a trend. Um, so, so it's social change here through collective behavior is literally contagious. Um, an example of this could be uh, people cheering at a sports game. Um, you know, or, or the way you feel you should cheer, or the way you should, you should applaud when an audience is applauding. Um, kind of your, your effort and your engagement is often just contagious. Um, if, you, if everyone around you believes in a social cause, you may then just go along with it, even if you don't have an opinion about it either way. Um, so again, it's pretty intuitive. Contagious theory is saying, uh, collective behavior could be deliberate, but I don't really think people are thinking that much about it. It's much more situational and almost like, like an infection that's spreading. Um, again, it could be good or bad. Contagion kind of makes it sound bad. Um, but again, bad only in the sense here that it's seen as more um, not deliberate, not calculated, more irrational. Um, convergence theory, on the other hand, is... It, it's deliberate, but it could also be, you know, not the best. Um, so here it's a certain kind of person. Um, so you'll see a kind of parallel with our deviance week and, and those early versions of uh, the, the, the biological determinism and, and the study of crime. Um, so here it's that certain people converge in their desire to do certain sorts of usually bad behavior. So this one, convergence theory, typically has a more negative connotation. So here they have soccer hooliganism. Um, so that's something that would happen more in like, I mean, that, when you think of hooligans, there's many, uh, that's a term that's used in more European countries um, and, and places where soccer or football, depending on what they call it, um, are really big. Um, so you could think of it in Brazil, you could think of it in S Scottish lads, um, who are often seen as hooligans, uh, British lads. Um, and they were people that would vandalize the streets and they'd get together um, around their convergence over um, kind of being, you know, their version of a, of a thug or a young um, rebel or whatever the, the idea was. Um, convergence theory could also apply um, to more positive things, but usually it doesn't. So you could think, you know, oh, <laughs> all of the Socio 3 students are converging in their love of sociology. Um, but typically, it's not, it hasn't been used that way, although you can make the argument to use it that way too. It's a more deliberate choice. Um, but here they say it's, it's, it's again, thinking to the, this originated more in the study of deviance, um, so it was more how people became gang members, thieves, um, hooligans, and things like that. Um, and then lastly, emergent norm theory. So this is the one that's probably the most relatable and the, and the most neutral. This is that collective behavior is the product of emergent norms. Um, so this is uh, people adjust to new norms that emerge within their given group and certain situations. And then when they see that those norms are being questioned or are being challenged, they may get together to change. So this would more be the example of students in Socio 3. So again, let's say um, with the, let's say during the storm, so a month ago, let's say every other professor had canceled all of their tests um, and you knew that it was them and it had nothing to do with the registrar's office, um, which if they said that they'd be lying. But let's say that's what happened. So they, they canceled it on their own. 
that could be an emergent norm, which you could then come email me and say, hey, well, all my other profs canceled their tests. Why aren't you doing that? And then you could go on Facebook and you could say, why is Lawrence being so evil? Everyone else is doing this. And then that's an emergent norm, right? You didn't do that ahead of time, but it just, it was contingent. It came out of that. Um, so it's not necessarily that something spread like wildfire, nor is it that you all kind of thought ahead of time, you know, how do I create this chaos? But a series of events led you to think, oh, actually the professor has the power to, to cancel a test when the weather's bad. Um, so we're going to rally and, and make that happen. Um, which again was my fear because I don't have that. So <laughs> that's always when there's asymmetrical information that, that those sorts of things can happen. Um, so again, dynamic exchange. So symbolic interaction is again much more focused on contingency um, and how norms uh, e evolve and come out of complicated um, interreactions. Um, okay, and then finally we have social movements. So again, collective behavior is one, so important to see. Social change happens largely as a result of collective behavior and or social movements. Um, so social movements themselves, so, so collective behavior was typically seen as short in duration. Again, remember the, the early definitions we looked at? Collective behavior could be one rally, one protest, um, one group getting together online, one discussion forum, one Facebook group chat, whatever, one, th one thing that's bounded in time. Um, remember last week we talked about space-biased media. So, so it's getting the word out um, and, and it's, it's about putting it out, not having it out forever. Social movement is, it, it needs to be space biased as well. It needs to be big, but it also wants to be time biased. So it wants both. It wants to be big and then it wants to endure. Social movements want that saturation change. Um, they're about usually tangible changes, but ones that will be tangible and permanent. Um, so. Social movements are established to stimulate change, get people thinking. Um, so these can be highly ideological in a neutral sense. Usually ideology has a negative connotation, but, but these are idea-based. Um, so social movements, again, are things like gender is, is this big social construction, and yet it you know, controls how men and women live. Um, we need to change this. Um, it could be, you know, we have this, this wonky idea of race, and we, we categorize people differently. Um, you know, there, there's ageism. Any of these topics of, of stratification um, are the seeds of social movements. Um, so specific local issues are usually how they start. Someone sees a gross act of negligence. Um, you know, maybe there's a trend of parents leaving their kids alone in their cars. Um, let's, uh, or there's, um, you know, mass shootings. Um, whatever the issue is, there's some specific local issue that people can point to, which then says we need to, we need to align, we need a coalition against this thing. Um, so mothers against drunk driving, for example, mad. Um, that was people see, many people losing their children um, to drunk drivers. Um, then you know mothers got together, um, and not just mothers, but primarily um, they got together and they said, you know, we need to have uh, a more stable and enduring movement against drunk driving. So we need to make penalties uh, stronger, but also raise awareness about how driving impaired can cause incidents. Uh, like this. Um, so giving the example of MAD, uh, social movements, uh, when they're formal, are usually large institutions that become integrated well uh, with society. Um, so again, mothers against drunk driving, social work even as an institution, sociology ideally you know will have public impact and, and increasingly uh, going forward much of the funding that sociologists uh, get is based on the policy implications of the work that we do um, so, so typically it's seen as effecting some sort of change again long term usually um, so social movements can be classified again some um, could be shorter in span, although usually the hallmark of social movements is that they're enduring, because you actually want, you know, think of what a social movement means. You want to move uh, society forward or backwards, perhaps, um, but you want to move society, uh, as you'll see, there's a direction of change, but you want to move it in some direction. Um, so, level of change, so what sort 
of magnitude does this have? So is this going to be a major change for everyone? Is it only going to impact some people? Will you barely notice it? Um, so if you, and, and, and that depends on your theory and your justification. So the level of change um, could be, you know, fairly significant for mothers against drunk driving, as this could lead to, um, you know, major reduction in unjustified deaths of people uh, via drunk drivers. Um, it could also, it's also good for the potential drunk drivers, since now they won't do this and potentially die themselves and be part of this horrific process. Um, so the level of change there, it could be seen as strong in magnitude, but not that difficult to do. Um, you know, raising, raising penalties and raising awareness about the significance of drunk driving. Um, the direction of change. So this is, do you want to move into something totally new, so an innovation, or do you want to move closer to the way things were done before? Um, so for example, if you want to change you know, gender norms in a school um, or change curriculum and university, add in a new program, are you making that change based on how things were done maybe 20, 30 years ago, or are you basing them on right now and saying we need to be different, we need something new? Um, so this would be, for example, let's say, let's say, uh, you know, many people think that math and, and math, uh, math in North America is not taught as well um, as it is in other countries. So would we move towards new pedagogy, new ways of teaching math to students, which some, I, again, I don't know because I've, I've, I'm a little bit um, out of that generation, um, but would we move more towards embracing new pedagogies, new Western ones, or would we move towards existing practices in, say, Asian countries, which are often seen stereotypically as teaching students better math skills? Um, so, so that's just a question. The change, is it moving? Um, you know, is it moving back in time to another country or forwards in time based on our values? Again, what role does ethnocentrism play in that? Um, and, and even stereotypes about which countries are better at math. Um, so, but those, those are questions that people have. So things like Kumon um, and stuff that came out of, uh, out of Asian schools, um, is, is that style um, the direction to go versus um, something new? Yep. The direction and target are similar, right? So it depends. Uh, uh, the thing is, the direction is more. Um, so the, the target of change is more the actual thing you want to change. The direction of change is where you want that to go. So they are different. So let's say that the target of change could be. So for for um, for what's it called? For mothers against drunk driving, the target of change is drunk drivers, and the direction is negative. So you want less. Right? So it depends on the case. Um, if it's something more abstract, they, it could be similar. So, um, but, but in most cases, the target is the person, um, that you, the person or the item that you want to change, and then the direction is where it's going. Um, so again, yeah, that's a good question. So for, for, for drunk driving, um, again, think of this. The level of change is it's happening at the level of people, but it's also impacting society and deaths and mortality. Um, the direction of change, um, we want to use our existing laws and maybe go a little bit harder in terms of drunk driving, and we want to use our you know, research on the correlation between drunk driving and deaths and just make that more accessible. Um, so the direction of change is, uh, again, rooted in lowering this, using existing knowledge, so nothing totally new. Um, and the speed of change, we would want that very quick. Um, again, be usually social issues where um, the topic is life and death, usually change is seen as much more imminent and, and important. Oops. Um, let's just see. Yeah, we don't have that much left. Um, okay, so... In terms of the types of social movements then, again, so you're looking at the direction, the speed, are they going back in time, forwards in time, are they targeting individuals, groups, societies, ideas? Um, the four main kinds you have are revolutionary, reformist, reactionary, and religious. So what does that mean? Um, so this, this is linked to those other factors. So again, revolutionary is saying, okay, we need this social movement because things got to give. They cannot keep occurring the way they are now. Um, so, for example, gender, uh, gender 
movement, gender social movements were often framed as revolutionary. Um, the civil rights movement was a revolution. Um, often these sorts of revolutionary ideas do result in physical uh, altercations, protests, even deaths. Um, so think of the North versus the South in America and, in, uh, you know, the, the huge war um, that they had over slavery. Um, that was an ideological warfare that related in a major uh, physical revolution. Reformist, uh, by contrast, they do want to change what's happening in society, but they don't want to veer that far away from the status quo. So they'd rather reform things that currently exist than reorganize society completely. So in the case of, of early America, this could be, okay, rather than completely abandoning um, all forms of slavery, it could be increasing the living conditions of current slaves um, or decreasing the discretionary power um, of current slave owners, for example. Um, and again, these, this, these are things that the North and South were divided on. Um, then reactionary, so thinking of those kind of emergent the symbolic interactionist um, examples of social movements. Um, a reactionary social movement could happen when a new law um, or a change is introduced. Um, so if you think of uh, the context of contemporary America, uh, many people call um, the kind of politics that's going on there populist and reactionary. Um, people reacting to, say, the economic recession and targeting immigration. Um, thinking, you know, the idea of a wall, uh, building a wall. That, that would be seen here as, a, as more or less a reactionary social movement um, where people are, are you know, questioning uh, certain changes that have happened. They're literally reacting to that um, and forming a movement based on that. Um, and then lastly, they could be religious in orientation. So this would be, say, if your religion was increasingly, and, and uh, it's appropriate given the student's comment earlier, um, in an age of increasing secularization, um, if people start to feel that their particular religion um, is being lost in wider society, um, if their churches or their places of worship are closing, um, if there's a lot of rumors or gossip about um, how quote-unquote irrational their religion is, uh, whatever the, the, the issue is, a religious social movement um, is one that's either based to re-empower that religion um, or to do a protest in the name of that religion. Um, so if there are certain things going on in society that are against your religion and then you protest protest, um, that could be a religious pro pr protest, or it could be one to um, empower that religion as well. Um, you could also have like a secular protest, which, which was against religion too, um, and, and that would fit as a religious social movement too, because that would be um, the target there. Um, so just as we talked about the life cycle of social change more broadly, um, social movements also have life cycles. Um, so again, I said, in terms of social movement, they're usually aiming to be enduring. But, as we know, society ebbs and flows in its values. Once a new thing comes up, there's often resistance. Um, so we can't just see the life cycle as being purely linear. Um, so the form of, social, of the life cycle is as follows. It emerges, then there's likely coalescence, then it's institutionalized, and then it often declines. So what does this look like? So for example, in the emergence, there's, there's some change that's happening. So for example, um, think of, again, the Me Too movement. Uh, so someone posted online, you know, something along the lines of write hashtag me too if you or someone you know has, has experienced um, you know, gendered or sexual violence. That begins to spread. It develops itself as a movement. Part of why Me Too stuck and is still around is that it tapped into people's existing beliefs. Um, so people already thought, um, especially in things like the entertainment industry and in politics, um, that, that usually women are often targeted uh, by, by powerful men and they feel they can't speak out. Um, so even here, we had already had the John Gameshi uh, um, event that happened. Um, and so that was already on the radar with celebrities, and it's been for a long time. Um, so the emergence of it, again, was somewhat disorganized. There was no clear leader. Um, 
And then people coalesced and they started, it, it became very much um, a gendered issue that tapped into the experiences of many women. Um, and, and it's not quite institutionalized yet, but the fact that you can say, um, you know, is some, has someone been quote unquote me too um, it's showing that it's becoming more of a thing. And you know what that means when someone says it. It means that someone uh, was called out for inappropriate sexual conduct. Um, so again, the stage here, it emerges. People coalesce in their shared uh, meaning of it. It takes a certain trajectory. Then it can become institutionalized. Um, but then most social movements don't stay institutionalized, unfortunately. Um, most often they will decline. Um, so many will collapse. Um, and, you know, this is when uh, fad is the wrong word, but, but social movements often become temporary. Um, they become things that people were really passionate about, and then it seems like just overnight they go away. Um, so people may be very issue, it may, may be very uh, excited or passionate about a given social cause. They'll get support. Some change will happen, but then ultimately um, funding will run out. People will move on to another issue, um, and it seems to kind of dissipate. Um, and then people have to fight for it again going forward. Um, so again, Me Too is a good example of this, only because very many, very many times throughout history um, have people called for, say, um, you know, higher penalties for sexual assault, raising uh, people's awareness of uh, the prevalence of sexual assault. There have been many cases that, that have come out over time, um, but they haven't resulted in major social change in this regard, uh, the major changing of laws and believing survivors and all of the things that go along with that. Um, so, you know, again, as, so, as a sociologist, you would say, what is preventing um, these movements that seem to be becoming institutionalized from fully sticking? Um, you know, is there a new law that can be made? How, what would this look like um, in the future? Um, so thinking about those sorts of questions, um, there are three major theories. So again, the, the, one, the, the most confusing thing of this week is that each, each uh, component of social change or social change collective behavior and um, social movements each have different theories. Uh, but they all make sense just when you, when you think about what's going on. So a social movement, again, is people that are usually interested in some more conceptual change and they want to make it permanent. Again, as opposed to collective behavior, which is people either getting together online or getting together in person um, to, to, you know, with their shared ideas. So the three major theories that I've chosen to focus on, again, the textbook has several, um, are rel these are the ones that are the most common when you just, if you took a course on social movements, these are the ones that are discussed the most, I believe. Um, so relative deprivation theory, mass society theory, and resource mobilization theory. Um, so relative deprivation theory is quite simple. It's that those individuals that are disenfranchised are the most likely to call for social movements. Um, so this is very Marxist and conflict theory based. Um, this is that the proletariat will rise. Uh, that's the kind of strongest example. Um, this example also makes sense of women's, women's lib, so women's liberation, the civil rights movement, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, the coalitions of disabled individuals, individuals that are relatively oppressed to, uh, in some regard, um, are then feeling relatively deprived. So that's the relative. It's relative, you know, some other category. So women in relation to men, racialized in, re in relation to white, um, uh, those with disabilities versus able-bodied individuals. Um, so here, the relative deprivation makes these individuals likely to come together and organize around their shared discontent, so their shared dissatisfaction. Um, mass society theory, on the other hand, says that um, there is a, it, it's similar. Um, this theory has got very little support, but it's still engaged with. Um, usually people will opt for relative deprivation instead of mass society theory. But mass society theory um, is critical of the overall 
industry that has uh, arisen in countries like Western democracies. Um, and following Durkheim says, you know, society has evolved too quickly and many people have been left behind and they feel alienated. So the term mass society means basically you have a bunch of individuals that should be forms of communities, but we're very splintered, um, we're very anomic. Um, so it's, it's a highly Durkheimian theory. Um, so it says people that are the most, and, and as much as I said it's not getting support, this theory is often being used now to explain the emergence of the far right um, in many countries. It's used to explain things like Brexit also. Um, so when people feel left out from politics, left out from social change, um, mass society theory says they may form extremist groups to try to reintegrate with society. Um, so again, it's very Durkheimian. Uh, remember, Durkheim looked at different societies and he said people could engage in the most extreme behavior, suicide, when they feel kind of out of sync with their peers. They, don't, they, they, they have no sense of um, affiliation, of community, of family. Um, they're likely to feel alienated and then could do something extreme. Um, and so, so the, while those two theories are much more about feeling, um, resource mobilization is much more pragmatic or rational in its approach. Um, so it's literally resource-based. So um, in resource mobilization theory, social movements happen when people get enough resources to mobilize together and create a movement. Um, so this investigates how, re so this is much more symbolic interactionist um, than, than grand or, or macro. Um, it, bas it looks at how successful social movements were able to mobilize resources to affect change. So feminism, for example, it took as long as it did for women to get um, many basic rights because women did not have the resources to band together uh, and to win people over. Um, until, you know, the 70s and 80s, and now even with Me Too, there's still the issue of sexual violence that hasn't been uh, made, made totally mainstream. Um, so the resources here would be, um, the, the, you know, obviously before women had the right to vote in the early 20th century, um, it would be very difficult for them to actually band together to vote similarly for people in power. Um, similarly, in the 50s and 60s, like, you know, after first wave feminism, but still before second wave feminism, um, when women were often relatively stuck in the home doing housework and they didn't have access to education in the same way, some did, but it was much more elite, um, it was harder for them to get together outside of the home for longer periods of time to kind of draft ideas and documents for change. Um, so here resources um, are needed for social movements to manifest. So you'll often see successful social movements happening from the relative elites. Um, so, that, so, you know, people fighting on behalf of, of the, of the have-nots, for example. Um, so it says, to what extent do resources factor into this process? Um, and this is why you can see, again, uh, when you look historically at social movements, um, very often they're, spearhe they're spearheaded by people that have a significant amount of money or um, who have a lot of social capital. They're plugged into networks. Um, that's, this theory often criticizes mass, mass society theory because it says, well, those people that are so alienated, they may be so impoverished and stuck working in the factories, stuck doing menial jobs, precarious work, that they won't get together. Um, it'll be too difficult for them. They don't have the resources. They can't leave their situations to do that. Yep. Oh, okay. um, the main two would be like money and education. Um, so if, if um, so for example, if you look at many feminist leaders, um, they're people who were able to get university education, then they would see differential treatment of, of men and women in these institutions. Um, they could write essays and documents um, and, and, and they could write in newspapers. So newspapers were huge in terms of early social movements. Um, but basically, if you had the time and the means to get your ideas out there and protest. Um, and that, again, is very difficult to do if you're feeling absolutely alienated. Um, that's why social movements usually, um, you know, they do occur most often in, in, in relatively deprived groups. Um, but those groups have to attain a certain level of status before they can revolt. Um, because, again, if you have very, very little resources, um, it's very hard to, to engage in that sort of behavior. So the time belongs to one of the resources, 
Yes? Yeah, time is linked to money, right? Time is money, as they always say. Um, so if you're so busy, you know, if you're not allowed out of your, if you have a curfew, so let's say there was going to be some children's revolution. Um, children are stuck in school all day. They're, they have, uh, you know, they have curfews made by their parents. Um, it would be very hard for children to somehow get together physically. Um, they could do that online, um, and you could actually, you know, there's actually a field of studies called children's studies, and, and they do look at children's social movements, but that's a very new thing that the internet has enabled. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so resources could be any, any tangible or intangible thing like time um, that is necessary when you actually unpack the social movement, um, and that, that way you can see that actually people that are extremely, extremely, you know, not comparing people's relative deprivation, I mean, relative deprivation is inherently comparative, but I don't mean it in that way. I just mean for people that are very, that are excluded to the point where they can't mobilize, they can't form a social movement. Um, that's often when you hear, you know, give voice to the voiceless and, and you see people, uh, organizations like UNICEF, for example, um, why they're about giving money to very young children is that those children can't form their own social movement. Also like PETA with animals, they can't form their own social movement. So um, again, it's not comparing groups in some awful way like that, but more saying as a sociologist, okay, um, what, what requirements are needed for a social movement to happen? Yeah? Uh, so would you say that the first two theories are more about how the social movements come to be, whereas the third is more about the uh, feasibility slash successfulness of you know, the, the, the existing social movement? Yes, that's a, that's a great, that's a, that's, um, a great observation. Um, I would say though, so resource mobilization is used as kind of a full theory now. Um, so those are often, relative deprivation and mass society are often just seen more as theoretical backdrops. Now, social movement scholars usually utilize, um, the, the theories that I haven't talked about here, like ethnic competition, they'll use that. Um, but they'll often use resource mobilization by saying, well, Ultimately, social movements may come about for some bigger philosophical reason, but really successful ones are successful based on the resources that they have. Um, so whether it's coming from uh, people's feeling of anime or even from their privilege. So if you're looking at social movements that are coming from elites, um, ones that succeed versus ones that don't are usually on the quantity and quality of the resources that they have available. Sounds like what we'll call kind of like knowledge is power. And mm -hmm. If you have knowledge, you can make those changes, but at the same time, you kind of like um, it's kind of like Weber's uh, protestant work ethics. Like, you know, time is money. So, like, the more time you have to like, make money and the capitalistic kind of like approach, mm -hmm. um, you can do that. You can make those like changes and whatnot. But I can't really, you know, differentiate the two. Like, I guess, like, which one do you think it's, it's more like fitting? Like when you're describing research mobilization, like Foucault or whoever's like protesting or ethics? Um, well, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I would definitely say it fits Faber more. Um, so Foucault as well, but the key idea with resource mobilization, so it's resources on two levels. So one, it's do you have the resources you need to make, to actually make your movement robust? And two is are you tapping into the resources of your audience? So that's where ideas come in and that's where Foucault kind of fits too. So it's, okay, let's say I'm trying to convince people that we need major gender changes in society, whatever that is. Let's say I'm focused on gender norms and I think beauty norms need to change uh, for men and women. Now, I need time and money and research knowledge to, to make those claims convincing, but I also have to go on, other, on the same ground as other people. So if people are not thinking about this, or let's say everyone's very conservative gender-wise in my neighborhood or wherever I'm trying to make my social movement, I'm not tapping into their resources, so it's not going to stick. So that's where Foucault fits, I think, in that you know he's looking at... Um, knowledge and power and, and that is influencing people. Um, but Weber fits really well there too because he's, you know, the, the Protestant ethic was, um, you know, people, people operate largely governed by ideas and tacit beliefs. Um, and, you know, his criticism of, of capitalism as being an iron cage was that people were just doing things without thinking. Um, so I think for resource mob mobilization, it's, you know, you could be really passionate about doing a social change or, or making something change. But if your audience doesn't even know it's an issue, um, they might not buy it. 
So, and, and that was Weber's criticism of, con of contemporary society, which kind of fits with mass society theory, that he said people don't really think about things anymore. And so maybe they wouldn't be open to social change because it, you're not tapping into their resources. You need to find some way to make beauty norms seem important to them. Um, imagine trying to have a conversation with someone who's like, what, there's gendered beauty ideals? I don't know, I'm just living my life. Um, you, know, you have to find a way to frame it on their terms where it would seem interesting, right? If there's just someone who's never thought about it, um, you know, that, that, that would be difficult. Yep. I want to make sure that if, the, if a social movement, they can be just, uh, they can uh, occur or happen just because of some intangible things such as knowledge and something rights, but they have to, just according to uh, resources, the mobilization theory, they have to base on some resources, and then they can, and finally they can to reach some tangible, tangible, just like tangible outcome. Just based on, they based on tangible matters and affected by the spiritual, uh, the intangible, uh, intangible things, spirits, and then to achieve some tangible outcome. Right, yeah, exactly. So the whole, it, it really resource mobilization fits in all of the theories uh, from the three components of social change or collective behavior and, and social movements as part of social change uh, because ultimately it's saying there's a series of tangible resources you need. Your audience needs to know that some tangible resources will be changed and the whole thing should be contextualized in a broader idea. So again, it sounds complicated, but let's say I want a social movement to make intro classes more accessible. My bigger idea behind that is that uh, education should be liberal and opening people's minds and everyone should have access to education. Um, however, certain courses are, are quite ableist, like there's not online content, people have to come to lectures and participate in these certain ways. Um, I want to open that up, um, so, so I'm, I'm hitting one tangible aim of in making Socio 3 more accessible, and my broader aim is um, you know, opening it up to more students, and that's important because uh, we all agree that education is supposed to be serving this higher function. Um, so again, all these different levels uh, of resource mobilization I think are important. Um, so just, you know, I don't have any questions for you. Uh, I sometimes have questions to think about going forward. Um, for this one, I've, I've kind of tapped them in, and I know this is a bit of a dense week in terms of the, the, the trilogy of terms. Um, so before I just get to my last little Mentimeter thing and my partial reveal, um, just something you can think about at home. Um, so can you think of some social movements that have occurred in your lifetime? Um, how do each of the following theories explain these movements? So again, relative deprivation, mass society, and resource mobilization. Um, and I, do, I know that this is probably the most complex, uh, these, these three theories and their um, alignment slash discrepancy. Um, so again, just think, you know, think in terms of concrete social movements you've seen. I would think, again, just as something relevant, and I've used it as an example, think of the Me Too movement. Think of what resources um, enabled this, right? Me Too largely happened via Twitter, right? That was, that was the big thing. Um, and it was actually a celebr it was celebrities uh, that made it huge. Um, I think it was, what was the show? Save, I think it was the, one of the actresses from, uh, from, Save the, from Who's the Boss, actually. Um, it was a, a, a woman from Toronto, I think, that originated it, a black woman. But, it was, but what made it big and viral um, was Alyssa Milano or something. I think her name was. Was it? I don't know. Anyway, so, um, but it, it took, a, it took you know, uh, someone in a position of social networks. So it was social networks and technology. Um, and again, Gender, um, uh, gender issues were already on people's radar, so the resources were there. Um, and, you know, it fits in with relative deprivation, too, in that it was targeting um, and largely in service of women who are, um, you know, bearing the brunt of a lot of societal ills. Um, okay. So, all right. So before we go... Okay.